basically low dimensional models, but I'm going to start off by motivating it with what I think of as a high dimensional model. So a few, let's see, I have to hit continue. So around the year 2000, uh, Eugenia Kalne joined the faculty of the University of Maryland and she had been instrumental in the use of ensemble multiple forecasts. Now what that means is that instead of making one forecast from one initial condition, you take a collection of slightly different initial conditions so that in fact, you never know what the exact initial condition is supposed to be. So a variety gives you a sampling of the possibilities. And then when you use each of these initial conditions to move forward a, a, a couple days or however long you want, the forecasts from the individual initial conditions may differ or they may be the same. If they're the same, then it's traditional say, well, we're fairly confident in our prediction of what will happen because the all the forecasts from this single model agree. Whereas if they differ, then you say, well, we really don't know. And how far ahead you can predict uh, depends purely, well, it depends on the model. It also depends on, on the state of the atmosphere. Sometimes the weather isn't very predictable. Uh, so I said we we're going to talk about low dimensional models. I don't know what your opinion of a high dimensional model is. Uh, we used a model that, that the National Weather Service used. Now, what we want to do here is figure out how to initialize the state of the atmosphere. How do we pick these this cloud of initial conditions? That's our goal. We're not trying to build a better model to predict the weather or the climate for that matter, but rather we are interested in, in how do we initialize. If your initial condition is poor, then you have a big problem. And um, well, I'm, I'm sitting here in New York City and uh, uh, you can imagine if we had a, a, a uh, grid covering the whole earth. We're talking about a whole earth model for the atmosphere. We want to predict its closed system. So we, we take a grid covering the surface of the earth and uh, let's see, we had a grid of 192 by 94. Not a very fine grid at all, but after all, we're just a bunch of university researchers with computers of 20 years ago. And we had 28 levels of the atmosphere. And at each grid point, we had six numbers, vorticity, temperature, ozone, pressure, and I forget the other two. Okay, so what, suppose we have to run the model. That means we need all 3 million numbers. If we're lacking any numbers, since it's a computer program, it won't run. So that's a problem. How do you come up with all this data? So for example, suppose in New York City, I stick a thermometer outside, I get the, I get the temperature. Well, that's maybe not very representative because my grid block is quite big and that's only one point in the grid. But even worse, I need another grid point 100 meters up and another 100 meters above that and 100 meters above that. How do you get all this data to run your model um, and, and, and redo this every six hours. So in a six hour period, I don't know why they chose six hours, but they did. So every six hours they reinitialize and they use data that was collected, for example, airplanes flying overhead, commercial airlines will radio in the atmospheric conditions and weather balloons and whatever other data they get. So they collect all this data, okay? And having collected the data, they then have to integrate it into the initial conditions. 
And the question is, how do you do that? And it's pretty clear that you're not going to have much of data from the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Um, so it's going to be very variable. And it's also clear I'm not going to have much data from 200 meters above me. So um, let me show you our approach. So suppose we have this ball of initial conditions here and uh, we look forward in time six hours and we get this each of these tr solutions moves forward to some dot. Now these dots are in three million dimensional space so it's a little bit hard to represent accurately. But what happens in a, in a six hour period the dynamics are pretty linear and so we can expect this to be moving someplace else in the three million dimensional space. Realistically, actually what we did is we segmented the earth into overlapping plates. And so we would have the New York region and then we would have another region nearby overlapping. And, and so let's suppose that, suppose that um, instead of 3 million variables, we had 10,000 in my New York plate. That means we need 10,000 of data in order to run the model. And so what, and in and, and particular, if we had 10,000 data points, highly correlated and, and they'd be missing a lot of information. So what we do is the following. We say, okay, we're going to watch this ball or the initial conditions area, and it's going to expand in some directions and contract in some and become an ellipsoid. And our idea was based on the local low dimensionality of the atmospheric dynamics. That's the paper we wrote early in the in this business. And so what we would find is that this ellipse might be expanding not in 10,000 directions, but maybe in 50. And then the others would be contracting or maybe neutral. So we have this ellipse expanding in 50 directions. How much data do we need to be able to establish what the initial condition is now? Imagine we want to find the center of this ellipsoid. How much data do we need? And the point is that if we know these conditions and we know that it is collapsed in 9,950 directions, we don't need to measure those directions. We, the model predicts where it's going to be. What we need is we need to know the, the extent of the expanse. Where are we on this expanding ellipse? So our model tells us well, the image is an ellipse. And so if it's a 50 dimensional expanding ellipse, then roughly speaking, we need 50 data points to tell where we are on the ellipse. And that was our basic idea, simple idea. Uh, now, National Weather Service said, well, if we do this, we have to be able to do it in 10 minutes for the entire world, including all the data. And so there were basic limitations. Furthermore, once we pick an initial, we might find, for example, this point over here is the right region. So we take one, we find the one of these, which is the best or a linear combination thereof to find a good initial state for the next six hours. And then we can make predictions. But we also have to worry about the extent of the ball. How much is our uncertainty in all these different directions? And that I'm not going to talk about, just to indicate that there's a lot more going on. And how do you program this thing? And it goes on and on. And um, so that's the basic idea. The idea is that we have a ball which is expanding sometimes in 50 direction dimensions, perhaps at another time expanding in 100 directions, and another time 40 directions. And the directions vary depending on where we are. 
is simply that we know that if we look at this model, it's going to go to an ellipse. And we can see which ellipse it is. And that's what we need is uh, the, the coordinates of the expanding direction. So another aspect that you can think about is that if you take a particular point here, there's a trajectory. And um, we introduced an idea of four dimensional ensemble Kalman filtering. Basically, we introduced ensemble Kalman filtering, but if you make measurements after three hours instead of six, that would mean they would be making a measurement which would correspond to a point along here, halfway through the trajectory. And another data point might be at four hours, another one at two hours. By looking at where these trajectories are at the times of these measurements, we can we can uh, use that to determine what is the best estimate for what the condition is now. Okay. So. Um, I would like to know how much variability there is in the local ensemble, ensemble dimension, di dimension. People have made measurements of periodic orbits and um, the dimensionality of the number of unstable dimensions of the periodic orbits will vary greatly in very low dimensional models of the atmosphere. Very low because calculating periodic orbits is rather hard to do. So I'm going to tell you about our efforts to understand this different unstable dimension aspect. So recall that we're talking about a state space which is expanding in some places more in more directions than in others. If you look at the simplest models of dynamical systems, you've got for example, a logistic map, a one-dimensional map. You've got the Lorenz system, which is one-dimensionally unstable. You've got the Henan map. Those are all very similar maps and they do not represent this kind of behavior that we're seeing. We wanted to create a model, a very simple model, which didn't have this behavior. So, we call this uh, heterogeneous chaos when the chaos is expanding in more directions in some places than in others. So the Lorenz 96 model is a model that Lorenz published in, uh, he, he published it in 1996 and in, in 1998, actually 1996, he submitted it to a meeting proceedings and it didn't occur, it didn't come out until something like 2003, which is why he republished it in 1998, I think. But in any case, this is a model and uh, you can adjust it to any dimension you want. This is similar to the Lorenz three-dimensional model, which you may or may not be familiar with. But in any case, um, <clears throat> Lorenz looked at this and he chose K to be 40 dimensional. So, so for example, XK runs from one to N, one to 40 in his case. And if you look at 41, you throw away the 40. This is periodic in K. So if this K is 40, this is becomes one. So it's a nice, simple model. We looked at it for n equals eight. And our forcing parameter was eight. And so we found for these particular choices, we had what looks like a blob of chaos. So the red is the blob of chaos. But what we actually found, uh, this is particularly work with Yoshi Saiki. Um, did these calculations. He found three different periodic orbits in here. 
with differing unstable dimensions. And which is which, I don't know. But you can see here, there's a dark blue. I hope you can see. That might be one dimensionally unstable. And the green orbit would be perhaps two dimensionally unstable. And, and the light blue one might be three dimensionally unstable. So this then is an example where we have three periodic orbits which appear to be in the attractor and they have different unstable dimensions. And early on in our investigations, that's what we are interested in. So um, in order to determine whether or not, so we looked at this projection, we projected it in, in, in a bunch of different ways. And these three orbits always seemed like they were inside. That doesn't guarantee they were inside. The idea would be if we picked an initial condition and we waited long enough, that particular initial condition would come close to each of these. And the longer you waited, it would get closer and closer, but then go away and then get closer and then get it'll go away just as a attractor. And once your space is moderately high dimensional, like even five dimensional, the, um, the time it takes to wander in the space to come close to other points in the space is can be rather long. So that in order to get within one unit, I haven't given you a scale, but to get within one unit of the periodic 100 million time steps. And if we wanted to get within a tenth of a unit, if you extrapolate that, it would take uh, something like 10 to the 15th time steps. So viable method. We would like to be able to see this kind of behavior in a simple model. And 40 is much lower than our 3 million dimensional model, but or even eight. So let me define what chaos is. And I should tell you that chaos itself doesn't have a definition because different users or different appliers of dynamical systems are going to use different definitions which are appropriate for what they're doing. If you're making numerical studies, for example, chaos might mean that you have a, a numerically computed Lyapunov exponent, which is positive. So it's unstable numerically over a finite time. In any case, chaos means that there's an attractor and it has a dense trajectory that wanders throughout this attractor, comes arbitrarily close to every point in the attractor, and it has an infinite dense set of periodic points. <coughs> so we're not using that Lyapunov exponent definition, which is a different one. Okay, let's be more specific. If we dealt with a logistic map, that's got one chaos. So it's one dimensional chaos. Um, it's unstable. It's got a dense set of periodic points. The attractor has a dense set of periodic points whose unstable dimension is one. And if we look at the Hainan map, hey, that's also one chaos. And the Lorenz system of differential equations, a three dimensional system is one chaos. So you keep looking at these different models and they look different, but they aren't really, really different properties. Find other models which are two dimensionally unstable, but heterochaos says simultaneously, you're going to have one chaos and two chaos, for example. You're going to have different values of K simultaneously for the same system. In particular, that means that orbits which are unstable in one direction if k equals one and unstable in two directions if k equals two. so those have to coexist and it seems like it's almost contradictory that arbitrarily close to each point in the attractor you're going to have behaviors which are one dimensionally unstable and simultaneously nearby arbitrarily close, you're going to have points which are two dimensionally unstable. 
so um, so this is a repeat of what I said, and uh, there are theoretical examples of this kind of behavior where you've got uh, multiple values of k coexisting, and they are pretty hard to understand, and they are not designed for uh, simplicity. But here is a simplest dynamical system. Um, let's see, this was first published in 1933. And you take a square and you take, you cut it in half. And then you take the left half to the bottom half. Do this, it's important, we're not rotating the blue we are not rotating the blue segment. We are squeezing it vertically and stretching it horizontally to get this. Similarly, this gets squeezed vertically and stretched horizontally. So, so, the, so it's called the Baker map because one can think of, of a bread dough and you slice the bread dough and then you squeeze it flat and then you pile up the two pieces on top of each other. Uh, and again, this is one dimensionally unstable. So if this is the X coordinate and the Y coordinate, it's unstable in the X direction. So all these models are K equals one, one dimensionally unstable. Now, we came up with a uh, modification of this where we made it a three-dimensional map and for our entertainment. So in order to distinguish between these different kinds of regions, we called regions that look like this. So this is a unit scale. These are the, in the United States, these are the kinds of boxes that pizzas are delivered in. And so, so a, we call this a pizza box. And what's going to happen is you're going to take this pizza box, which is long in two directions, and you're going to squeeze it down in two directions. And so A is going to map over here to A prime, which is long, or D is going to map over to D prime. And we call D prime a shoe box. So a shoe box is long in one direction, and it's small in the other one, but the, the volume is the same. So this mapping, instead of cutting it into two pieces, we've cut it into four pieces and we map it over like so. So this is expanding in one direction. Again, we have K equals one, but we can also take the inverse, just map it the other way, take the unit cubes, divide it into four shoe boxes and each shoe box gets squeezed in this direction and it expands in two directions and you get a pizza box. Okay, so this is an example then of a two dimensional chaos. If you're going from right to left, you're getting two dimensional expansion. Okay. Now, thinking in terms of this map, let's generalize this map in the following way. We're going to cut the square into four pieces. And A and B, this gets a little bit tricky. A is going to map over to here onto the bottom half. So the left third of the square gets mapped to the bottom half. No rotation, squeezing and stretching. D is the same, it goes on top. Well, so A and D together map onto the entire square. What about B and C? B maps, B gets expanded in both directions and maps onto the entire square. C gets expanded in both directions, maps onto the entire square. So if you took a little region like inside that D and you say, where did this come from? And you say, where did it, you look back here, it'll come from the same area. The inverse image of this will have pieces from B, C, and D, 
and together their area will add up to the area of the little d. It's area preserving in the backward sense. And this is a rather complicated dynamical system. It seems like it's just a modern minor variant, but it's quite complicated. So here we have K chaos, and this is expanding in uh, B and C in two dimensions, and in A and D, it's K is one. So these are intermixed. And so what we actually were able to prove here um, is that this is got heterochaos. Now, the top of this cube is what I was talking to you about. And if you turned it into a three-dimensional cube, now D, well, you would refer back to here, D goes to the top half. That means the top piece up here, the upper part here. But it also, that's, that's the X and Z coordinates, but the Y coordinate puts it down here. D is shrinking vertically. It's expanding in the X direction. It's contracting in the Z direction. So it's contracting in two directions. This is a volume preserving map. So we have two pizza boxes, each mapped to a shoe box, and two shoe boxes that map to pizza boxes. Now, if you took a particular point and followed it, almost any initial point would wander through the entire cube as you keep on iterating and iterating the map. And it'll wander through the, come, it'll come arbitrarily close to every point and there will be periodic orbits which spend a certain amount of time in A and a certain amount of time in B and C and A. And they are unstable. And the, the so um, what we're able to prove is that, that uh, um, the map is ergodic, which basically means that most trajectories almost every initial condition you chose would be um, would be chaotic and would wander densely through the entire cube. The periodic orbits are not, the individual periodic orbits are not dense, but collectively the, the periodic orbits that are one dimensionally unstable are dense. So if you picked any point in the cube, you could find a periodic orbit of period uh, of long period, which was one dimensionally unstable and arbitrarily close to it, you could find one which was two dimensionally unstable. All of this is coexisting. Now this is beginning to show some of the properties of the, uh, of the three million dimensional model that we were talking about. And it would be interesting to know what other kinds of variations on this one could get. Uh, I should add here that this is a, a model we came up with as a parenthetical comment that you could take this B and slice it up instead of one piece, it becomes three pieces. Actually, we've changed the positions a little bit. And we can take these three, these are now shoe boxes as it was before, and they map to three pizza boxes. Again, volume preserving. And uh, one can imagine in the atmosphere, as you travel through the atmosphere, the state space, it's hard not to picture the state space as representing New York. It doesn't. The state space represents the entire world. But for certain states of the atmosphere, it's more unstable than others. OK, that's the end of my story on this particular map. But uh, this is the first map that's uh, a simple map that one can understand, which has got this heterochaos behavior. Next, I'm going to tell you about an even simpler map. And perhaps many of you are familiar with the uh, logistic map. 
And the logistic map is a, a one dimensional map. Let me show you the equation here. So this is the logistic map and you pick a value of R between one and four. So this represents R along this axis as you choose a particular value of R. So here's the value of R, for example, 3.83. And at 3.83, there's a periodic orbit of period three. One, two, three. In 1975, we published a paper which talked about things like this. We were actually motivated by Edward Lorenz's paper on the Lorenz system of differential equations. But we said, if you have a period three point for some parameter value of R, then you also have a lot of other stuff. And this is going to be, uh, this is for my summary, but for you, um, if you have a period three orbit of a continuous map on an interval, um, Lorenz had a map which was spiked on the top. He reduced his differential equation to a one dimensional map, but um, looks different, but this applies. So what happens then is you have lots of periodic orbits, guaranteed. And secondly, there's an uncountable set of points in which the mapping is mixing. And we call this scrambled. Imagine that you have an egg and you're scrambling an egg on a pan and this egg remains soft and you're, so you're scrambling and scrambling and scrambling. Take two points. Of the, of the egg. And as you follow it in time, they'll get close together and move apart and get closer together and move apart and get closer together and move apart. And they get arbitrarily close, but move apart. And that's what we were observing in this mapping. All of that would exist along with the period three behavior. And we call that scrambled for scrambled being scrambled how you mix, how you scramble eggs. And it's an uncountable set, scrambled set. And uh, here's a picture we've, we created, which shows you what's actually happening. Again, let's take this blue point here as 3.83. What, wait, wait, no, this, I guess this is 3.83, somewhere in here. And we have the period three orbit. But what happens is almost every initial point you choose will eventually settle onto the period three orbit. But there's an uncountable set of points, a Cantor set of points in red. Take one of these vertical slices, call it 3.83. And we get this uncountable Cantor set, which is invariant, coexisting along with this period three orbit. And if you were now, the reason you might be interested in this, if you were say a climate scientist is that, well, now let's change R a little bit. And here we go to period six, this is period doubles and it period doubles again. And then we get chaos. This is a chaos in a limited region from these three regions. But what happens is there's a collision at this parameter value between the red chaos the unstable red chaos and the chaos that you know, know the attractor, unless you have rather special techniques for looking for other kinds of things going on. And what happens then is there's a sudden discontinuous change. We call it a crisis, a crisis at the end of this, where, the, where this hidden Cantor set merges with the attractor and the attractor gets much bigger. And Actually, I don't have any particularly good ways of telling you what happens. We found that almost always a collision point is a periodic orbit. So while this is a period three orbit, here there's a saddle node bifurcation. And at this point, you create two periodic orbits. The bottom of this red piece is a periodic point, And this is a periodic point. 
And as you move on, this chaotic attractor collides with this uh, red periodic orbit and it just gets worse. Now that's all going on in the logistic map. And the reason I'm telling you about the logistic map is because it is so simple. It's worth understanding because it's so simple, we can understand how complicated it is. If we try to look at Lorenz's 40 dimensional model, it's much harder to figure out what's going on because it's 40 dimensional. Now, another thing that happens over here, here we have, well, the overall picture is here we had a chaotic attractor. Let's see if we can go back here. We have, we can, generally speaking, we have chaos here. Now we come down to here, we're looking at a particular window in which we have the period three behavior. But down here, we have period nine behavior. And over here, this might be period uh, 15 behavior. And this is period 18 behavior, all kinds of behaviors going on. But what happens here is that here we get this fractal, this red fractal. And now there's a blue fractal that's appeared. So within the Lorenz system, if we tune our parameters carefully, we can get not only a tractor, which would be a period nine orbit, we get the red canter set, which is unstable, and the blue canter set, which is unstable. And all you see is the period nine, but all of this is going on. And these sets affect the bifurcations that you see. Okay, so what's happened here is if we zoom in on this piece, it looks like the big piece. Again, we're looking at this tiny little window. We call this a period three window and we zoom in for the R values between here and here. And um, we see, well, okay, what happens if we look at this piece right in here? Well, we're looking at this in, that's this piece in here and it has a period three window within the period three window. And within that, there's gonna be a, other period three windows or period five windows or period seven windows. All of this stuff is coexisting for the, for the logistic map, the simplest nonlinear map you can write down. So a way of look, talking about these maps um, as there have been a number of people, there's Charlie Conley from, uh, I believe the 1980s who talked about this. Well, we, he says, he's, we can look at an attractor here as a node of a graph. And then we can look at this canter set as another node. And by the way, zero is also a solution, a, a fixed point, and that's another node. And so, we can represent the dynamics at a particular, well, let's see, over here is the blue one. If we look over here, we've got the red attractor, the blue attractor, sorry, the red fractal, which is not an attractor, the blue fractal, which is not an attractor, and the black attractor, all of these things coexisting. There are other values where we may have infinitely many periodic orbits, Feigenbaum periodic orbits, an infinite number of them coexisting at the same parameter value, all of them unstable, except for a Cantor set. So what we're, what we're saying here is you can choose your parameters. There are an uncountable, inf uncountably infinite number of ways of choosing your parameters. So that you actually have infinitely many layers coexisting, just as we have the red and the blue and the black, <coughs> we will have infinitely many of these things coexisting for the logistic map. <coughs> and uh, this is a blow up. Um, I'm not gonna tell you about that. Here's an example of how you take a dynamical system on a torus and there are four fixed points and you can write them down like so into a graph. 
And if you perturb from this fixed point, you can drift down to any one of the other three fixed points. Thus, we connect it with an edge. And what we found is that the, um, that we call this a tower, where you've got a, some number of nodes, which are invariant sets, and it, you can perturb from any one of them and go down to the other one. Or you can control it and stay there with arbitrarily small controls. So our theorem says that there are uncountably many parameter values, R values, where there are infinitely many of these, these, these nodes. And you can take any infinite sequence of fractals and periodic orbits and fractals and periodic orbits, whatever sequence you want, and it'll exist for some number of parameters. In the period doubling case limit, you'll have all periodic orbits. If you take windows within windows within windows, you'll get all fractal sets. Now, this is the Lorenz system um, of differential equations. It's a three-dimensional Lorenz system. And people turn that into a map by in the following way. So they, they draw a horizontal plane. And every time the trajectory crosses in a downward fashion, they, they record which point it's at. So this is a three-dimensional Lorenz system. And you take a, a point in this horizontal plane, which is traditionally used that if this r is 28, you choose this at r at z equals, this is the z coordinate, and you choose r minus one. In any case, you basically get a mapping on the plane. And so it becomes a little bit like the logistic map. And we chose the Lorenz system because the Lorenz system seems so different from the logistic map. I hope you agree that, that you wouldn't think of the Lorenz system as the cousin of the logistic map. But in fact, the bifurcation diagram, as you vary your parameter r, these are quite similar. So here I've taken this logistic map. I had to flip it upside down in order to make it look like the Lorenz bifurcation diagram. And over here, so here we see the, the blue regions and the red regions and the attractors. And the green is some unstable periodic orbits. Over here, you have the same behavior except we suspect there's more going on than we can see. But all of the complexity of the logistic map is present in the Lorenz system. When we're looking at parameter values of the logistic map, here we're talking about somewhere around 208. Now, Lorenz looked at r equals 28. Here we're looking at 208. And so, Basically, what we're finding here is that, that the pathologies that we find in the logistic map are also going to be present with the Lorenz system. And we basically believe that it's going to be present with many, many other high dimensional systems. So again, these sets are important because of the crises that occur and cause sudden jumps. And well, we've got uh, nope, that I'm going to quit here because my time's about up. And those two, both of these are um, projects, the logistic and the Lorenz. Um, are stuff that we've published, uh, or it's in press to be published this year. So this work is with Roberto DeLeo, who is from Washington, DC and from Sardinia. So let me quit here. Thank you very much. Um, can I ask the million dollar question now? 
Ah, uh -huh. <laughs> only a million. <laughs> so the, the billion dollar question. So does the does the atmosphere exhibit heterochaos or the climate system? And what I am. Learn? I mean, I am pretty sure that it does. And uh, uh, but with trying to demonstrate anything like that is quite difficult. Therefore, we created these tiny dimensional models mm -hmm. to exhibit. I mean, somebody might say, well, oh, that couldn't possibly occur. Heterochaos in the atmosphere. Say, look, here's a three dimensional model where you've got heterochaos and it occurs there. Certainly it can occur in higher dimensional systems. So that was our thinking. Mm -hmm. And is there a way to show that it, it occurs for uh, atmospheric models? Well, what people have done, now we're saying that these periodic orbits, these period K orbits occur arbitrarily close to every initial point. That would be very difficult to show. Mm -hmm. But people have shown as I, as uh, with Yossi's calculations in the eight dimensional Lorenz system mm -hmm. that um, he could find three periodic orbits, not dense sets, just three. And he found some others also, but in no way would you be convinced. And we started looking for this. We didn't have in mind that we should be looking for a dense set of periodic orbits. We've looked at this for some number of years trying to understand this structure. So we're, we often jump into topics where we're rather ignorant and we hope to learn more as we go along. So I really like this intuitive Baker map because it really shows you hands on how, how it happens in a very simple system. So it's really, it's really yeah, nice. I'm glad you like that one. That's where this is. So Here's. we have some questions rolling in at the Q&A by now. It's the 3D. Maybe you can see these as boxes of uh, calzone. <laughs> Not pizza. <laughs> So, uh, first question by uh, Evaiter Bach. Great talk, Jim. Is there a connection between the unstable dimension of the periodic orbits and the fluctuations of the finite time gap of exponents? Yes. There's, um, well, if you look at the biggest Lyapunov exponent, that art might remain positive for a long period of time. But if you look at the next biggest one, suppose, for example, you were looking at this particular system that's on the screen right now. And there would be initial points where the second Lyapunov exponent was contracting sometimes and expanding at other times. And so you'd get fluctuations over, you pick some amount of time, 50 time steps. And as you look at different initial conditions, you're going to get different fluctuations. Sometimes it's expanding and sometimes it's contracting while the main one remains expanding. And uh, we actually constructed this so that the, so that there's no dominant direction, expanding direction. And yet it all coexists. So next question. So thank you. Uh, the next question is uh, from Thomas Gilbert. Thank you for the nice talk. Thinking about the Baker map, I would have thought dimension four would be more natural than three. You lose the symplectic structure, right? I think four is more natural than three and five is more natural than four and 10 is more natural than five, but At this point, we have only succeeded in looking at three dimensions. And uh, now, if it was in four dimensions, we would hope to make a model which is has unstable, one unstable directions, two unstable directions, and three unstable directions coexisting. And how do you do this for n dimensions so that you have 
and unstable directions, all coexisting in a model which is relatively easy to communicate. We have not moved in that direction, but I would like to see somebody move in that direction. Right. Uh, the next question by Vishnu Ravindran. Uh, will the directions which are unstable change with time as the system evolves? So how is a lower order modeling valid if all dimensions take part in the evolution, but at different time scales? Well, there's a basic, there's a basic question. If you take a numerical trajectory and you've got all these and you don't have dominant expanding directions, your numerical solutions will not necessarily exhibit of true solutions. Now, if we're only looking at the weather for a short period of time, like a week or two weeks, then probably it doesn't matter. But if we're looking at a climate model over a long period of time, it could be that the numerics create artifacts. One can't rule this out because we know that in these models that, that the numerical trajectories are not shadowed by true trajectories. In the Baker map, you do get this shadowing property that numerical trajectories are very similar to true, tra given any numerical trajectory or the logistic map, given any numerical trajectory, there's a true trajectory which stays very close to the numerical one, but not in some of these other ones. So I cannot give you any guarantees, quite the opposite. Hopefully these pathologies are rare. In any case, one looks up the theory of shadowing uh, of trajectories. Okay, thank you. Next question by Christopher Jones. Conley characterized the nodes as chain recurrent sets. Can you do that also? Can we? Characterize the nodes as chain recurrent sets. That's our definition. That, that's the definition that Charlie Conley, I mentioned, said. And the way I characterize chain recurrent sets is if you have a this fractal set and you have a tiny amount of control, of feedback control, you can stay close to the Cantor set. So this is an equivalent version of chain recurrent, though we use the chain term chain recurrent in the in our paper. You can find this uh, on the archive, York and DeLeo. Um, did I get that right? Yes. Robert, Roberto DeLeo. So all I can say is I, I agree with Christopher. Okay, another remark by Thomas Gilbert. P.S. What about time reversal symmetry, by the way? So. Time reversal symmetry. <clears throat> These are dissipative systems. So that when we were originally talking about the uh, these kinds of things, this is not a Hamiltonian system. I should come down to here. So when I'm saying it's collapsing in 9,000 directions and it's expanding in 50, this is really not very time reversible. Um, I mean, strictly speaking, trajectories will reverse, but the behavior, uh, small errors will cause this to blow up. If you go forwards in time, you hope to stay near states which are likely to be accessed by the atmosphere. But if you go backwards in time, you may just have solutions blow up to infinity. So there's no backward time reversal. Um, except along individual trajectories, if you do it exactly correctly. Uh, Next. Question from De Melo Verissimo, uh, Francis Francisco. Uh, thank you for, for the very nice talk. I have a rather naive question. You started by saying that you want to develop a method to improve the quality of the forecast, relying on improving initial data. Suppose the atmosphere or climate system does have heterochaos. What does it mean in terms of methods for designing ensembles? I guess you need more info beyond proof of existence. 
Apologies if this is obvious, but it was not clear to me how these things connect to each other. Okay, so suppose we have this thing which is expanding in 50 directions. We can, if we get something like data points, then we can figure out where we are on this 50 dimensional ellipsoid. But if next week it turns out to be expanding in 150 directions, then our 100 data points are no longer adequate. And all of a sudden we have a complete breakdown of the scheme of, uh, of data assimilation, which means we need to have enough measurements so that even the more unlikely changes in direction are going to be covered or perhaps just we just don't make the we don't make a prediction i hope that's an answer so does it mean that your observation system needs to i don't know perform better in certain uh, situations than in others well we I, you could say that or you could say that our our data assimilation scheme will behave worse in some situations than others now, in the New York question, if we have jets flying overhead collecting data, we're easily going to get 100 data points or 200 data points. But we have to be able to incorporate these into our, our, into our data assimilation scheme so as to come up with a correct data. But, but I also said someplace here, what I would like to know and I don't know how much variation there is in the unstable direction. And people have probably looked at this. Um, one of the aspects of this method is that there's no tuning of the method. So if you want to use this scheme, all you need is the model, which may have been tuned to realistic situations. You don't team tune, tune this scheme, which means that if you are in a situation which is rather unusual, the scheme works just as well as one where you have lots of historical data. You don't need any historical data to, to run this model. And the traditional methods do require 4D VAR, requires a lot of historical data. And therefore I would speculate that 4D VAR is not as good in unusual circumstances as it is in normal circumstances. And in weather, what's interesting What's important are the unusual circumstances. It's not when it's a kind of rainy day or a little bit clouds and so on. It's the hurricanes and the tornadoes and uh, which you don't get in Europe. But uh, in any case, so let me cut the, my answer off that, <laughs> that one. Next. Okay, thank you. So uh, final comment by Thomas Gilbert. So the Baker map is built on time reversal symmetry. So the example is, I guess. Uh, is, yes, is, yes, I think so. Mm -hmm. I guess this was related to the time symmetry uh, mentioned before. Mm -hmm. so. Well, it's it backwards. So this contracts by a factor of two in the vertical direction and expands by a factor of two in the horizontal direction. Blue piece goes to this blue piece. And going the other way, it's pretty much the same thing. I don't know if it's time reversal symmetry or not, but it, its behavior is pretty close to being the same. So I think we have no more open questions. Um, so I would like to thank you again for uh, giving the seminar and uh, 